Destiny. Has there ever been a simpler word that could spark so much emotion? Hate. Resentment. Passion. Love. For so long, fans of the franchise have been mocked for supporting it. Destiny the Taken Wallet. Destiny the Curse of Activision. Guess what? Activision isn't here anymore. That's what spurred this admittedly late video on my part, because let me tell you now, Forsaken was a triumph. A magnificent achievement. They were on a good track, now they're free. The runaway train can take flight. I cannot wait to see where this game is going, but now it's time to see how far this game has come. That's what this video is all about. When my first video came out, the state of this game was a laughing stock. I was one of the first people who jumped off the Destiny Redemption bandwagon and called the game what it was. An embarrassment, with a failure of a story, broken loot, terrible PvP, and worse gameplay than the first. How do you even manage that? Bungie had a considerable workload for Year 5, which is a kind way of putting it. Let's check their solutions. This is Year in Review. I want this video to be relevant to everyone, people who've played Year 5 and people who missed it. To keep us on track, I'll be structuring the video around a series of questions that'll hopefully allow this video to function as a critique of Forsaken, an assessment of Year 5, and a summary of the state of Destiny 2. The only things I won't go into detail on will be seasonal events, the Crucible meta, and raid design. All of this was made possible by my friend Stormball3323, or Jazz529Go. Without him, there's no chance in hell I'd have half the footage I needed to make this video. So huge thanks go out to him and the Dead Elephants clan. Yeah, that's a real name. I was a founding member, I rolled with it, it grows on you, I swear. So, to find a solution, first we need a problem. And thanks to Year 4, there was no bigger problem than gameplay. Has Destiny addressed the critical gameplay flaws that made the sequel a regression from the first? Destiny 2 Year 5 is what Destiny 2 Year 4 was supposed to be. 2017 was an opportunity to make fundamental gameplay changes, to improve PvE and aid an imbalanced Crucible. If you listen closely, you can still hear the echoes of raging Destiny 1 PvPers carried on the wind. Much of the balance issues were caused by the special slot. In their respective ranges, specials were a one-shot kill. Year 4's genius solution was moving special weapon types into the heavy slot and replacing it with another primary. Two primaries, one heavy. There are five primary weapon types, and now that you've got two slots, you'll play with those select few constantly. A select few that are by design unspecialized. A shotgun or a sniper gives reasons to go long range or aggressive. Primaries? Not so much. Everyone began to share a far more mundane playstyle, and that was made worse by heavy snipers and shotguns. They have no chance to change up your play if you never use them, which you never would because rocket launchers exist. The entire system was a thermonuclear cock-up. Year 5 went hard reverse. Kinetic, energy, and power. Not necessarily primary, special, and heavy. Those classifications now only determine ammo type, not slot. So yeah, you can have three snipers on at the same time, why not? Well, because two of the snipers will use special ammo, so you'll run out before you know it. But still, it's your choice. Any slot can have any weapon type, but only specific non-heavies would use power ammo. Whisper goes in the power slot because it's just naturally hyper-strong. It's arbitrary, but it allows Bungie far more freedom. They could develop a primary ammo rocket launcher or a heavy ammo hand cannon. The power fantasy is at the core of what it is to play as a Guardian. Give me weapons that make me move, that throw me into the action and make me feel skilled. If I only wanted to play with versatile mid-range rifles, I'd play COD. But now I'm playing Destiny. With a fully customizable playstyle and a huge variation of weapons, Forsaken has made it feel good to be a Guardian. This is what sets the stage for the rest of the experience to shine, and Forsaken would have been half the expansion it was, were it not for these fundamental gameplay improvements. But Bungie didn't stop with the fundamentals, oh no. The big three supplementary additions would be the new subclass trees, the new weapon type, and the new enemy type. Now, the bow is a bit of a cliché in FPS games, I mean, really. What good is a bow meant to be in the future when you've got a 500 pound machine gun firing at half the speed of light? Let me tell you, quite good. Most of the footage you'll be seeing from now on will no doubt be of the bow, and that's because I couldn't put it down. Let's find out why. The function of ADS is obvious, but hipfire has a very distinct utility in Destiny 2. It's less accurate than ADS, which always lands pinpoint shots, but it's far more maneuverable. However, once you've fully drawn the string, the hipfire reticule is small enough to ensure accurate shots at close range. So if you're good enough, look forward to throwing out close quarters headshots one after the other like Space Legolas. 
Further depth is added by the drawstring. This is a very standard mechanic. You can tap fire at extremely close range because the falloff doesn't matter and most enemies that rush you have low health to begin with. But what's cool is that once it's fully drawn, marked by this unbelievably satisfying click, it's hit scan so you don't need to lead your shots or account for gravity. At first, the simplicity seems unrewarding, but for Destiny, with its sky-high enemy counts, it works perfectly. Though they're still a bit underpowered, through hitscan, the bow can compete with guns at any range. Of course, being able to walk around with a fully drawn hitscan shot that you don't need ADS for might be a bit of an issue in the Crucible. Bungie thought of that too. If the bow is drawn for more than 5 seconds or so, the shot releases. Not realistic for the compound bows, but neither is hitscan. It works. That's what matters. Great depth, fantastic animation, my love for the feeling aside, the bow is an excellent addition to the primary roster. It's good then that we've got some new targets to complete the package. It had been three years since the last enemy type, and no, Siva doesn't count. To put it simply, it was about time, so buckle up for some in-depth analysis of Destiny's enemy types. To get a base, look at the Fallen, Hive, Vex, and Cabal. All fun to fight, but the ways you engage with them differ very little. How do you fight any given enemy from those factions? You break a shield if it has one, and then shoot its crit spot. The only things they can do is shoot or melee with minor exceptions here and there. Then along came the Taken. Every Taken enemy has an additional quirk. Scions multiply, captains blind you, wizards spawn shadow thrall, phalanxes knock you back. Another layer of depth that adds just a little more thought to their engagements. For example, whereas a normal phalanx incites a little movement to get a shot on its head, a taken phalanx does that as well as heavily encourages situational awareness, because you can be knocked off a cliff or into the midst of more enemies. However, the way you fight the taken is the same for every enemy type. Because each enemy's quirk just makes it more dangerous, your response is always to prioritize targets. Gotta deal with X enemy quickly, else it'll bite me in the ass later. Which enemy to prioritize depends on the context, but that's what it always boils down to. The Scorn are different. The quirks of each Scorn type create more interesting gameplay, oftentimes via synergy, and therefore they incite more from the player than simple prioritization. The Screebs are only dangerous when they attack in packs and they surprise you. Their explosions can be used to detonate each other and their allies, so timing when to detonate them can be tactical, and setting off a huge arc chain reaction is extremely satisfying. The Ravager's ether tunneling makes keeping up with them a challenge of tracking. The Chieftain's Death Sprinklers, of which there are three types, all interact with you in different ways, and gravity especially can create very uniquely dangerous situations. What I'm saying is, interacting with the Scorn's quirks creates more interesting and satisfying gameplay than interacting with a Taken, who only incite a small bit of movement and prioritization from the player. I'm saying the Scorn are better than the Taken, and the reason I'm saying that is because the Taken were previously the best enemy type in the game. The Scorn are absolutely fantastic enemies, and the best edition we've had since 2015. Interesting gameplay seems to be a theme with Forsaken. It is a Taken King type expansion, so we came to expect new subclasses. It had been three years of the same. Well, we didn't get new subclasses. We got nine new supers with nine new subclass trees. I had an issue with how you got your light back in year four. It was homogenized and boring compared to the Taken King. Well, this is just as bad. You talk to trees for 10 minutes, and that's not even a joke. Taken King was capable of delivering an impactful and personal experience out of reused Crucible maps, because they probably had about 30 minutes of development time and $30 between them. That they still couldn't top this three years later is a disappointment. The subclasses themselves sure ain't. And that's primarily because the subclass trees are more than just a bunch of passives. Almost all of them have something interesting. The Sunbreaker's got a hammer it can throw infinitely as long as you pick it up each time. The Voidwalker can eat its grenade in exchange for a short range but highly damaging burst. The Arc Strider can slide into a massive uppercut. And there's usually a lot of synergy with the perks. Dawnblades, for example, get their grenades back quicker if they heal their allies, and they use their grenades to heal their allies. Hunters get melee back if they kill burning enemies, and their melee burns enemies. Essentially, play to the strengths of your subclass the best you can, and you'll be rewarded. But not all subclasses have such synergy. It's either that or nothing at all, which can make some of them feel kinda weak, Arc Warlock among them. While plenty of supers kick ass, yes please I want to be Space Magic Iron Man, many of them are surprisingly underwhelming. Burning Maul is a worse two-handed hammer of soul. The Arc Hunter one where you twirl your disco stick is just another move on the same super as before. The Thought Seeking Missile is fun, but it's just the same thing as Fist of Havoc. The idea of nine new subclasses with nine new supers makes a whole lot of sense now that we have Arc Void and Solar for every class. It's unfortunate that we're still locked into these restrictive trees, but it's undeniable that a lot of what was achieved with the newer ones take advantage of it. With the Destiny 1 system, every perk in a column needs to be balanced against the other perks in a column. The Sunbreaker's hammer wouldn't work because it'd be the only good choice. But with Destiny 2, you only need to balance the tree as a whole. 
Furthermore, a lot of what makes the synergy here work is the supplementary perks in the tree. You need them all. Put the supplementary perks into their respective Destiny 1 columns and they become the only logical choice if you pick the base perk. The freedom then isn't so useful, though I still think there's a compromise somewhere between both systems. Destiny 1 had its benefits, but the only benefits Destiny 2 system could have brought are being used to their full potential with these new trees. So. We have the best subclass trees in the game, an excellent new weapon type, the best new enemy type since 2014, and overhauled gameplay thanks to higher movement speed and loadout freedom. Yeah, they fixed Destiny 2's gameplay. I'd say they've nearly mastered it. On that note, is Forsaken's content an improvement over the Red Wall? Many things are better than the Red War, among them are most 19th century diseases and global nuclear annihilation, so I didn't expect lightning to strike twice. Yeah, Forsaken's content is better. Better in obvious ways, and in some much more subtle. Forsaken's campaign is only half a Forsaken, and what's special about that is that nobody even knew. We started with the impression the trailers give us, that this would be a space western classic revenge plot to avenge our fallen friend. This is half of the experience content-wise, which is important to stress because it alone is among the best campaigns the franchise has ever received. I originally wanted to separate story and content into two clear-cut questions, but I realised that it's impossible to talk about one without talking about the other. Forsaken storytelling is just so unexpectedly brilliant, and the first glimmers of that are seen where it all starts. What I like about the prison riot from a narrative perspective is how it's all initially portrayed. Everything is made to seem typical, like this is just another Tuesday for Cade and the Guardians. The music makes it feel like a swashbuckling romp through enemies who have no idea who they're messing with. They're no threat to you, and that contrasted with the progression into a darker and darker tone, the realisation that they are a threat makes it so much more effective. I truly wish they never spoiled Cade's death, because can you imagine how unexpected it would have been? How much more enraged we would have been if the beginning of the mission was allowed to fool us entirely? Cade is soon trapped and he fights his hardest, but the killing blow is dealt the moment he brought his ghost into the rifleman's sights. Cade's got one life left, and it's not enough. Aldrin Sov takes the final shot. He survived the Dreadnought, and he wants something. Doesn't matter. He killed Cade, our best friend. The premise is set. We will find Aldrin, and we will have revenge. At the tower, Zavala is unwilling to provide support. He will not see any more friends die, he says. Ikora calls him a coward. I call him an idiot. Aldrin's got an army of scorn. Do you not think that might be a problem? Being unprepared for an attack almost wiped out humanity last campaign. And since when was this man against sending guardians into uncertain battles? Was it not Papa Smurf here who one DLC ago was willing to send you alone into a fight with a worm god, not even expecting support from Rasputin? I'm not calling Zavala out for a laugh, I'm trying to say Bungie should really maintain internal consistency with their character writing. Aldrin, at the behest of the Queen? Took the Barons of the Scorn and fled to the Tangled Shore. We're set into another linear mission just like the Prison Riot, but that changes quickly. Forsaken is very clever with its content distribution. You're railroaded through the first couple missions, which neatly set the premise, familiarises you with the layout of the Tangled Shore, and gives you a clear goal. Up until you meet the Spider, who at first wants you to do five bounties for him. They might be, do a few public events, do some patrols. It's a very natural way to familiarise you with the shore before you're taken off the tracks, and the Barons are yours for the culling. Each Baron has a recommended light level, which sets somewhat of a path, but you don't need to follow it. You might even cross paths with one of them out in the open world during other activities, which is cool because when someone's fighting the Mad Bomber or the Rifleman, you can step in and help them out. I'll tell you what's really cool. These missions aren't missions, they're adventures, which allows you to start them seamlessly, no loading screen, and means you can replay them at will. That's a good thing, because you'll want to. Though short, 10 to 15 minutes, each one is remarkably creative and well-paced. The Rider, for example, you find a pike, charge it up, use it to kill a bunch of the Rider's minions, then go into this vast, toxic wasteland and have a high-speed pike versus pike boss fight. It's fast, creative, varied, it's fantastic. The Trickster drops exotic engrams and heavy ammo that suddenly become bombs, bombs that you can return to sender. The Mindbender has his very own throne world in a crashed hive ship for a boss arena. There's not a single weak adventure here. Thanks to the freedom, you really do feel like a bounty hunter picking off targets. An excellent partition of the campaign. 
The adventures don't cover every Baron, though. The Mechanist has her own mission, a great boss fight, unfortunately preceded by another of Destiny 2's oh-so-brilliantly designed tank missions. Both here and in the Red War, we have a completely linear shooting gallery which is practically impossible to die in. The Drake is ridiculously beefy, and if at any point you get low, you can just drive over these blue health pads. Might as well have some lunch and hit up the phone sex lines because you'll be sat there for what feels like months, making it even more boring than driving the damn thing. Vehicle sections aren't boring by nature, and we can poetically use Halo to prove that. Firstly, Halo's vehicle sections felt empowering after having been a relatively small presence previously in the mission. Secondly, the tank wasn't invincible, and destruction had weight. Enemy tanks could mess you up, so you had to at the very least pay attention or you'd pay in other ways. It was important to go down somewhere that another vehicle could be found, and the lives of friendly soldiers were at stake too, giving you a sort of moral investment in playing well. And finally, we weren't stuck in a linear arena the whole time. Bungie have two options for the Drake sections. Sort it or abort it. With the Mechanist down, only the Fanatic remains, but Aldrin almost has what he wants. The battle for the Watchtower begins trenches away, aided by the Spider's forces. The Fanatic awaits within the Watchtower's walls. The fight isn't rich, but it is conclusive. As you push on through the halls and the stairways of the Watchtower, you'll find yourself slipping into a different reality. The Ascendant Plane, your path is shattered and the sky is black. Seems like the Taken are here for a reason. Aldrin reaches his destination near some kind of mirror, a mirror that acts as a gateway. The Queen pushes him to present a shard of the Traveler to it, but he's hesitant. He desperately wants to bring his sister back, but he clearly knows something is wrong. He eventually overcomes his reluctance, and does as he's bid. The mirror activates, and the Queen comes through. Or so he thinks. What takes him is not what I expected. Honestly, I thought this would be one of Oryx's sisters, not something resembling the asses of prisoners who get done for online hacking three weeks into their sentence. Huh. Well, strange appearances aside, it eats Aldrin and then turns its sight on you. Destiny's not exactly had many good campaign bosses, and by not many, I mean two. Oryx and this, the voice of Riven. We seem to be looking at similar movement AI to the Servitors, which it does look to be in part composed of. It'll continually pound you with void boomers and most dangerously, oversized heat-seeking Axion bolts. The cover in the arena was clearly well thought out, because there's no safe space, there's no way you can hide reliably without being shot by the boss or the hordes of Taken that follow it. This is what keeps the fight so intense, because the best defense, unless you're a Bubble Titan or a Weld Warlock, is always an extremely strong offense. You gotta kill those Taken, you gotta shoot those bolts. And when you've done enough damage, you gotta shoot a series of blights that charge the boss's shield, each of which is placed between the rock formations of the arena, forcing you out of hiding. You'll also sometimes teleport into the Ascendant Plane, more Taken to kill, more blights to shoot. This just seems like a bit of fight padding, but who cares? You're in the Ascendant Plane. You're asking yourself, what is this? Why was I teleporting? Here. You're asking yourself, why can't I stop headbanging? And the answer to that is the music. It's a heavily edited version of the Watchtower track, which I enjoyed so much that dying and therefore hearing it again was as much fun as the fight. This is easily the hardest campaign boss, mainly thanks to the level design and the average light of the player at the time. I also think it's the best. Better than Oryx. An excellent final encounter. Suck on that, Gaul. The death of the voice releases Aldrin, and he's just as confused as you. Guns are pointed, ready to take revenge. According to him, the line between light and dark is so very thin. Do we know what side we're on? We hesitate. Petra doesn't. The screen fades to black and the shot is fired. We win. We got our revenge. But this isn't a happy conclusion. This adventure is a questioning of your own morality as much as it is a classic revenge plot. Guardians stretch the definition of what it is to be a guardian. Primarily, they're a strike force. They invade foreign territory and slaughter the inhabitants by the thousand. You are probably the biggest mass murderer in the system, but we've always had the excuse of protecting the last city. We can justify that if we hadn't killed them all, innocent lives would be at risk. But when Aldrin dies, you did that for revenge. He's not a threat without Riven controlling him, and yet we stood by as Petra shot him in the head because it pleased us, and that will have consequences. But for now, it's simply a way of flipping Destiny's happy endings on their head. It makes the ending so much more intriguing to top a simple but excellent campaign. People were satisfied. Little did they know what came next. The Dreaming City. The Awoken Watchtower Aldrin made his last stand in was all a way to find it. The Awoken's true home and the most closely guarded secret in the Reef. Of everything the Dreaming City gets right, the most remarkable thing is that it's hidden. There is no big announcement that you should go there. No fanfare about it, just some broken talisman. I know some players on launch who completely forgot about it, thinking they'd only care until the raid. Not so. 
The Dreaming City emanates secrecy, but especially for those on launch, its very scale felt hidden. And even now, that does a lot for the narrative. Gaul was made out to be this Oryx-level threat. He was the only villain since 2014 that actually managed to outplay the Guardians. And yet, his boss fight was a joke. I've got trees in my garden who could beat this. Many wanted him to be the raid boss, but not everyone wants to do the raid, and reviewers especially are guaranteed to throw a fit over the fact that they couldn't kill the big bad without raiding. So no one really wins. But here, it's fixed. You do avenge Cade after this adequately challenging final boss. And it's not the real end of the story. There's still the Awoken mystery and the dark force that orchestrated the whole plot. Riven still awaits in the raid. So now we get an interesting, built-up final boss in the raid, and some basic closure on the story that was promised. We get revenge, we kill Aldrin. It's really smart. I think I have to take it back. The writers at Bungie aren't Muppets. Took a year, but they did it. I gotta go pop open the bubbly. The Dreaming City looks like a dream. Gardens, ornate structures, technologies beyond wonder. One of which speaks with a very familiar voice. The Queen, Mara Sov. The Queen Aldrin saw was clearly a lie. So how can she still be alive? Petra is convinced. The Queen tells you to kill the monster at the heart of this city. That's your direction. The rest is up to you. From the bird's eye, the Dreaming City is no more complex than any other. It's the usual circular design, divided this time into three major sectors. Rhea Silva, the Strand, and the Dvalian Mists. But then you look closer. That's just what the Dreaming City is about, looking closer. Secrets. Exploring this gargantuan beauty by simply following the normal paths will take you long enough. There's a lot to see. The gardens of Elsia, the beautiful ravines, the misted lake in, you guessed it, the Dvalian Mists. But just under the surface, there's a network of ancient awoken halls that'll take you from arena to arena, from secret to secret. If you map it out, you can use certain portals as fast travel. You'll even stumble upon the skull of an Ahamkara. And if you pay it 50 Baryon Bows, you'll get a tincture of Queen's Foil. With this, the secrets of the Dreaming City become much more clear. Literally. You'll be able to see hidden platforms that lead you to Ascendant Chests, and in some areas, to Ahamkara Bones. Secrets are a part of the heart of Destiny. This is a beautiful, rich world with a gripping atmosphere and an adoring community. Players are dying to scratch beneath the surface. And that was a lesson Bungie learned from The Whisper of the Worm. This was a part of Year One's life cycle, which I never covered. That's because I don't want to get age restricted and subsequently have my channel demonetized, but one of the few good things that came out of Warmind was the Whisper mission. A complete and total secret, populated by endless secrets of its own. It's got a dark, mysterious atmosphere, and for some unfathomable reason, it's backed by 80th synth. What? Well, I don't know. But it's amazing, that's for sure. Hearing Zol lambast you from the shadows feels very Mass Effect or Transformers G1. It's remarkable. The incredible reward, the lore significance, the challenge, everything the community wanted is here. And consensus was that there needs to be more of this kind of thing. Secrets is what we want. They gave us a city of them. Among the hidden are the Ahamkara Bones, which rewards lore and contributes to the Triumph. Triumphs are the new version of the record book and grimoire score. Third time's the charm. If you complete certain tasks, you get score, which makes you cooler than everyone else. Especially so if you complete the tasks required for a title, a great way for vets to show how large their metaphorical penises are. But not everyone deserving is rewarded equally, and that's thanks to the badges associated with them. To get most titles, you need to have every single item from any given location, including cosmetics. There are some players who've put more hours into this game than I have into breathing, who still don't have titles because they've been screwed by the RNG on a Sparrow or a Nightfall rocket launcher. It's ridiculous. If the titles need to be hard to get, then so be it. But insane RNG is not the way to go. Still, an excellent concept, with only a few flaws to be ironed out. If you watch my original Destiny 2 critique, you'll know my thoughts on Destiny's lore. I love this sci-fi. It's deep when it needs to be, and it never fails to be interesting. So having the Grimoire at arm's reach is fantastic. Yeah, it took him five years, but better late than never, right? Lore's a good reward, but with this many collectibles, this many places to hide them, it seems like it would have been an opportunity for another touch of malice in Outbreak Prime. An elusive exotic hidden behind all the collectibles would have drawn far more players to explore. Unsurprisingly, being Ascendant is for far more than just climbing platforms. Enter the Ascendant Challenge, which changes place and type weekly, and usually revolves around killing a boss or doing a mechanic under extreme threat. For an example, one of them has you parkour around the map, destroying blights in pitch darkness to open up shards in the middle, all of which need taking out. But good luck, because there's a squad of Ascendant Knights waiting to pound you into space lasagna. 
Challenge is an apt name. They're unique, they're tense, they're rewarding, and they can also be quite frustrating. If you die, you spawn back outside the Ascendant plane and the challenge resets, but it wouldn't reset if someone else was still in there, which is why having a fire team made it so much easier back before everyone was 12,000 light. This might encourage team play, but it drove solo players either into madness or into the LFG, which is just an unnecessary frustration. Thankfully, I had clanmates. What the Dreaming City has achieved with its layout and collectibles and ascendant doohickeys is characterize the setting itself within the gameplay. There's plenty to be said about how lacking Destiny 2's base planets were compared to the first game, but this is something we've never even seen before, just like every other leap and bound made by Forsaken. Though, not every jump gets over the bar. The Dreaming City isn't free of problems, and one is posed by its very existence. To put it simply, it renders the Tangled Shore utterly pointless. You can still buy useful items from the Spider, but beyond the weekly powerful gear bounty, you won't have much reason to return. No point in redoing the Barrens, the strikes continue to be meaningless outside of Nightfalls, the Lost Sector loot is capped, and the same goes for public events. It's a real shame that half the expansion is left behind thanks to capped loot, despite how necessary the attention on the Dreaming City is. They could have done Baron exclusive exotics, they could have had weekly challenging bounties to hunt Barons for a powerful engram. Heroic public events could have dropped exclusives. Or even simpler, they could have had some more of Petra's bounties take you back to the Tangled Shore. You do the three lost sectors in the Dreaming City repeatedly, but there's little reason to do them in the Shore more than once. What's worse is that there's so much content in the Shore that the game never encourages you to do, not even once. Lost sectors in the three strikes. After the campaign, you'll be at about 460, while light progression skyrockets. So you've got about 40 light to make those activities worthwhile before their loot is capped at 500. You might not have made that work even if you knew. A drastic change in a world where strikes used to be the backbone of PvE. I did Warden of Nothing and Broodhold as Nightfalls only, because the normal version is redundant. Surely you just give a powerful gear for first completion, a request, or anything to say these are worth doing. Guess not. It's an important oversight, because these things are worth doing. For the experience, at least. Warden of Nothing is arguably the best strike in the franchise. The AI running the prison went mental trying to stop the riot, so now you've got to decommission it by force. The throwbacks to Destiny 1 combined with the new mechanics and creative ideas is a surprisingly easy way of explaining its quality. You've got Sparrow train dodging, even the Prison of Elders comes back just like it was in House of Wolves. Fighting waves, diffusing mines, yes, which works very well in a strike environment. Just like back in Mardir, you had to head on down to the treasury to collect your reward, but this time the tricksters rigged the room to blow. Nothing's predictable in this strike. The final boss uses an AoE heat blast to deal damage, so you have to hide in the shadows to avoid it. And this is another boss where the theme is better than the gameplay. The Fnatic strike was solid, though I did feel slightly let down by the PS4 exclusive Broodhold. It's great that I've now fought Pontiff Sullivan in Dark Souls and Destiny, but I think this had a lot more potential. The Sister Witches from the Court of Oryx where you'd have to kill both at the same time was a lot more engaging than simply shoot two of the thing. Overall, strikes are solid. Not strong enough to avoid being crushed by the bus they were thrown under though. It's a big deal that all of this content ended up meaning so little. The expansion is lucky that the Dreaming City is even better. The Dreaming City's last swing and a miss, in my opinion, is the Blind Well. Like Taken King and Rise of Iron, Forsaken has its version of Court of Oryx, a public space where you compete against enemies of different tiers to get unique rewards. Blind Well is in the same vein, but worse in every conceivable way. Starting with the problems we've had since 2015, you have to hope you find a group of other people when you enter it. If not, go to orbit and try again. The LFG often ends up being a nightmare because you've got to pull a switcheroo on the fireteam system to get more than three people in. So getting in is your first issue. Second issue is that it's boring. Like Court, there's multiple tiers. Tier 1 through 4, where 1 to 3 are waves and a boss, and 4 is only a boss, and only after you finish Tier 3. So, why is the well boring? Well, your team starts in the center. You kill a number of scorn or taken until the light percentage gets to 100, when you move on to the next well and repeat about five times. The catch is there's a bubble surrounding the well, and you'll be slowly killed if you step outside. So, you're inside this bubble, restricted movement as a result, for 15 or so minutes shooting endless waves. It's not great. Harmony is a temporary respite. Kill a servant of the plague, grab the orbit drops, and you'll be free to run around outside the bubble until the effect fades. A noticeable consolation. If you get to the boss without a ruptured aneurysm, Harmony is required to bring down the boss's shield. Tier 1 has one boss, Tier 2 has two, and so on until Tier 4, which is three at a time, and then one final boss, which is never particularly impressive. Thanks to the time limit, you gotta be quick. You gotta focus fire and pack the DPS. It's tense, but it's no Court of Oryx. See, those bosses weren't preceded by a chore. In fact, I still think Court is the best iteration of Court since Court. Why? Creativity. Density. Every boss in court had a unique and interesting mechanic. 
be it the witches who would only die if you killed them both near the same time, the ogre who would only take shield damage from cursed thrall explosions, or the knights who would only be vulnerable if they were close enough together. Tier 2 would spawn two bosses at once, encouraging a hell of a lot of team play and communication. Finally, Tier 3. Crota, the big man himself. There's a huge difference between reusing Crota, a legendary raid boss designed for team play, and reusing the voice of Riven, a campaign boss who was great because of the arena. Low tier court bosses were soloable too, but the only players who'll be able to do that in the well don't need the rewards anyway, because only tier 4 drops anything above 500 light and only once a week, which is lower than the light you need to be at to even compete at tier 4, or tier 3, or to be effective in tier 2 at the first place. Yeah. There's no reward for blind well. The blues don't matter if you're in the 99% of people who won't even try it by the time blues are obsolete. You can get a powerful drop by doing a weekly tier 4, but the real reason to bother with well is the oracle's offering. This becomes crucial, but I can't quite talk about it until I hype up the Dreaming City again, so let's look at the cycle. The entire city is on a forever repeating three week loop, and to understand why, we've got to go back to the very first time it happened. The first week of the Dreaming City had nothing of note. The Scorn waged war with the Taken, everyone was just grinding light for the raid which would finally drop on the Friday of the second week. It took the world's first team 15 hours to complete. I was watching when they did, a moment I'll never forget. But they didn't just complete the raid for themselves, they had killed Riven for everyone, and in the cutscene we all received after they'd done it, we were shown that this was exactly what Riven wanted. A curse had befallen the city, but the team had unlocked a new strike and a new mission for everyone. Bungie delivered and unexpectedly expanded upon the continually evolving narrative of the Dreaming City with the world's first raid completion. Never before have the story, the gameplay, and even the community been so closely tied, as if watching Twitch was part of the narrative. The strike we got was fantastic, very fun boss mechanics, but the reason we all did it was to save Sedia, a Techian who guides you through the subsequent three missions, each one unlocked on reset day. They were simplistic fights throughout the city, with only small tidbits of lore as you go, but they perfectly quantify the increasing severity of the curse. By week three, the city is dead, blights dominate the sky, but thanks to the charged blind well, the path to the Queen's throne world is clear. The Shattered Throne is not a mission, and it's not a strike, and it's also not a raid. This is a dungeon, for the first time. Best to find as a three-man mini-raid. Encounters are less tough, there are fewer bosses, but the environments feel very large and grand. I appreciate the creativity that went into designing these encounters. Fighting ogres atop the rafters of the Cathedral of the Deep. Running away from Shadow Thrall while not being able to run. Yeah, that's not so much fun for the guy at the back. The final boss still in Karu is the demon at the center of all of this. There's a lot more to her than meets the eye. Dungeons are an interesting concept, and I would have liked to see another in year 5, but I do feel like they're in a problematic position. Raids come with benefits and drawbacks. Of course, the mechanical mastery, the tight team play, and the spectacular grandeur of these encounters make raiding a uniquely enjoyable experience. But on the other hand, you are going to have to wade through the LFG and take hours upon hours upon hours out of your day relying on the consistent competence of five other people to clear it. The quality of an LFG team is random. People quit, people have to go walk their dogs, people have to get shouted at by their parents, people have to ask me, and I quote, say tea and crumpets. People have to spend time with their families like this is some kind of kindergarten pussy 3 plus Mario game and not a goddamn war. Jokes aside, relying on people can make for a uniquely frustrating experience. The Shattered Throne takes about 45 minutes, but for a very long time in year 5 it was 45 minutes give or take. Mostly give, because you needed a fire team. If I have to use the LFG, the value of having people with me better be met. I'm looking for that tight team play and I don't see a lot of that for the Shattered Throne. But it's not as fun soloable because there's so much emptiness. It's not got the intensity of a mission or a strike. This is an issue with dungeon design that I do hope is worked around in the future. Requires LFG people, but outside of numbers difficulty, doesn't make particularly engaging use of them. Just putting it out there, but I can only think of one encounter in the Shattered Throne that wouldn't work with matchmaking. Despite this problem, the Shattered Throne is still about 45 minutes worth of creative, lore-rich, and entertaining encounters. Which is particularly cool because Bungie just threw this out there with no warning. It was another surprise, and that's what made it so special. That and the fact that it's much more meaningful than the content it provides. At this week of the cycle, the height of the curse, the oracle's offering from the blind well will open a pathway and a portal into the oracle engine. To the queen's true throne, she's really alive. How or why she's here, I'm not sure. Why she gives you soft cap loot, I also don't understand. She tells you that some things are more dangerous dead than alive. That this will all happen again, and again, and again. That this is the fate of her people. 
and all that clicks into place when on the next Tuesday of Forsaken, everything in the city is back to normal. The mission's reset, you're now on the first of three. The Shattered Throne is closed and the Oracle Engine opens no portal, but the Awoken in the mission seem to be aware. This might have happened before, so what's really going on? At the core of Destiny is a simple moral conflict, destroy versus protect, but most importantly, take versus give, the deep versus the sky. In this way, the Traveler and the Worm Gods are the exact opposite of one another. Thus, the Guardians and the Hive are equally opposed. Guardians may be the galaxy's greatest serial killers, but by nature, they do so to save the small remaining pockets of weak humans. The Hive exists to destroy. They take anything they can and crush anything below them. They see strength as a measure of one's worthiness to exist. The Worm Gods taught Oryx and his sister this philosophy. Take power. Destroy those who might one day try to destroy you. And so he did. He murdered one of the Worm Gods, Akka, and took its power to commune with the darkness. This is how Oryx gained the power to take. Oryx is dead. But still in the Dreaming City, the Taken roam. So who controls the Taken? It's the Taken Queen. Savathun and Zebu Arath, the other two Hive Gods, are already at work. According to Toland, who we listen to in the Ascendant Plane, Coria is the key. A Vex mind that simulates Oryx perfectly. A Vex mind that Oryx crushed and gifted to Savathun. She is, as a result, the Taken Queen. Supposedly, Riven is the monster at the heart of the Dreaming City. She's where the corruption pours from and it's up to you to slay her. That's what Mara Sov asked of you. So off you go, charging the blind well, gaining light to get raid ready. You descend into the raid, destroy the Techians and kill Riven once and for all. Or maybe just once. Riven is an Ahamkara. Dead or alive, their power remains. And Savathun asked Riven to grant her a wish upon death. Allow Dil Inkaru into the Shattered Throne, the Queen's Throne World. The Queen's Throne World is under the Blind Well and can only open once the Blind Well is charged. That's our part in her plan. Only our light can charge the well. And while we're doing that, Dul Inkaru corrupts the entire Dreaming City from within. As she searches, she's the source of the true corruption and you've got to kill her. And that's the trick, because whenever Dil Inkaru dies, the city resets and the cycle begins again. For as long as we keep killing Riven and Dul Inkaru, the cycle goes on forever. Why? It's to protect her. It's to keep Dylan Karu safe so she can find the truth of the Awoken people. The Dreaming City is all but a stronghold. Their true home has been hidden away. It's only been a few centuries since the Collapse, which means the Awoken have somehow managed to build all this perfection in almost no time at all. But they did have time. There's a space-time singularity in the Reef, and inside it, the Awoken have resided for longer than we could know. They have a homeworld, the Distributary, where time is so warped that the Awoken inside are immortal. Savathun sees this as an opportunity. If she could find a way in, slaughter them all, then she'd grow vastly more powerful in a tiny amount of time. She'd even be able to make her worm feed on cunning rather than death. That's the situation we're at. The time loop was implemented by Coria, so if we destroy it or convince it to stop, everything could change. The mystery of the Dreaming City and how we're going to stop it is still questioned today. The cards, the dialogue, the subtle hints have built up this situation beautifully. We didn't have to go online and read what's going on, we can gather the vast majority of it from the world around us. Characters that have been involved behind the scenes for years all play their roles to contribute to the most fascinating threat the Guardians have ever faced. And it's great to see that Savathun gained the upper hand because of smarts and deceit instead of the plot bending over backwards for them. <coughs> Gaul. I have no clue what they're planning to do next with Sabathun, Coria, Sin, Koz, or Tan. No idea. But goddamn am I excited. Let's just appreciate the situation here. We've got a full campaign with its own story, lore, and themes, which directly link into and cause this second meta campaign. We win the first campaign so everyone walks away satisfied, but we lose the second campaign, which sets up an even bigger plot. The Dreaming City has managed to tell the overarching story in this week-by-week -week manner. Having the story and lore take into account not just your actions, but the way the weeks reset every Tuesday is a starkly more gripping method of storytelling that they didn't have to tell. No one expected the Dreaming City to be this deep. No one expected there to be anything more significant than a couple of puzzles and the raid. Yet they did all this. Yeah, Forsaken's content was better than the Red War. Forsaken's content was flawed in many ways, but it's a triumph in so many more. Shadowkeep has a lot to live up to. Speaking of things that are better than the Red War, which is everything, is the loot not terrible this time? What's most important is that random rolls are back. Multiple copies of the same gun will have different perks, so at the very least you'll weigh up the difference on repeat drops, which gives loot more value over a longer period. Endgame wins the most here. 
because with random rolls, getting a drop once isn't the only time you'll want to get it, so more reasons to play. Another improvement, weapons and armor have selectable perks. The perks themselves are desirable too. Ammo drop rates, extra aim assist on certain weapons, higher ability recharge, it's really easy to make a build now. If your class is reliant on grenades, you can just make sure you always select the grenade recharge perk. If you like bows, then choose armor pieces with bow benefits. Like gear 4, you can further upgrade your gear with mods, which have been completely revamped. They're now costly, but greatly effective. I find it hard to be impressed with Bungie for these changes when there's no reason year 4 should have gone backwards in the first place, but it's a huge success nonetheless. After they cleaned up their mess, we were treated to Bungie's new way of rewarding dedicated players. Pinnacle weapons. You'd spend a few decades doing tasks in Strikes, Crucible, or Gambit, and you'd get your weapon. They're genuine beasts, oftentimes better than exotics. That'd be a problem if it wasn't such a task to get your hands on them. But I don't think Bungie have it quite right just yet. Right now, the meta is Mountaintop and Recluse for PvE, Crucible, and Gambo. Yet they're both Crucible Pinnacle weapons. So if I wanted the best loadout for PvE, I'm going to have to grind Crucible. That seems extremely annoying. The solution to this isn't make Crucible Pinnacles worse in PvE, because good PvE perks are often the same as good PvP perks. It's make the Vanguard Pinnacles better in PvE than the Crucible ones. Simple as that. Mountaintop isn't off the hook yet though, because the quest is something to behold. Getting to Fabled, well, just be good at Crucible. If you can't do that, then the weapon's not for you. Getting 100 calculated trajectories, are you being a funny man? That's get three grenade launcher kills in one life, 100 times. This is possibly the worst quest step in franchise history. I honestly can't think of anything worse. And to find out why, we're first going to address exotic weapons. Has Destiny found a way to make exotics great again? Well, drop rate is only half the picture. On the plus side, exotics can just drop from enemies now, which is fantastic because it's vastly more satisfying than buying it from a vendor or going to a crypt arc. Even if it came from some random dreg, there's a story attached to that weapon now, one that you might never forget. Having exotics live up to their title in terms of rarity hasn't been realized for a very long time. But in year 5, we're closer to year 1 levels of rarity than ever before. But that's not everything that makes an exotic. The ideal situation is being both cool and rare, because then they'll be sought after and viewed as a long-term goal. Thanks to Zir though, the rarity isn't quite the same thing. You can just buy a fated engram to get a guaranteed exotic you don't already have. Remove this though, and you end up with frustrating repeats too often. It's tough. But there is a solution, and when it isn't applied to everything, it's a good one. Exotic quests. It's no surprise most exotics this year have been tied to them. The best way of addressing this is gonna be by example. Let's start with a good exotic quest and I think Outbreak Perfected is one of the best. You remember that quest on Titan where you had to choose between a fallen captain and a hive knight? Remember how if you save the captain, he'd leave peacefully? Well, he's back. Yes, Bungie, legendary move. Our boys found sulking in the previously empty basement from the farm, and not long after, you'll find yourself in zero hour. This is a Whisper of the Worm type mission. There's secrets, challenging navigation, beautiful scenery, and a time limit. I got this from a comment. You know what pairs well with missions that involve mazes, branching paths, puzzles, and tons of exploration in dark, confined, confusing passages? If you said a time limit, you're wrong. The time limit makes it more challenging, that's absolutely true, but I find it counterproductive in a mission that requires so much exploration and has so much atmosphere to take in. You're putting yourself at a serious disadvantage if you don't have Datto's guide up next to you. It's a shame, because there's a lot you'll want to take in. It shows you the last city like you've never seen it before, and is rife with creative gameplay challenges. Mazes, parkour, navigating through spinning fans. For a single exotic quest, this mission is Hall of Fame tier, though it doesn't quite have the same charm as Whisper. It will require an LFG for most people, which I'm not a huge fan of, but this definitely could not have been matchmade. A fantastic exotic quest overall. Every other exotic quest? Uh, Thunderlord's good, Ace of Spades is okay, and the rest ranges from tedious to frustrating to actively detrimenting the player base to all three. Let's have a look at Malfeasance. First step is getting the first step. You have to lock into the correct primeval spawning, which was real fun for most of the year. And because there's two teams in Gambit, only one of which can win, it's a toss-up if you'll even kill yours first. Once you've started the quest, you have to kill 25 taken bosses, complete a strike, deposit 400 moats in Gambit, and finally wipe out all four enemy guardians as an invader in Gambit. All four, so either be extremely good at PvP or get lucky with whatever the meta one-shot gun is that day, or have a teammate do it. 
three times. This quest requires a grind even Tony Hawk would be impressed with, but that's not why it's bad. It's bad because it's frustrating, tedious, and encourages suboptimal play. Frustration is born from inconsistency. If I have little to no control over my success, then my success could take 15 minutes or 15 hours. Having to wipe the entire enemy team, the amount of factors that go into this are astronomical. The biggest source of frustration by far on exotic quests is forced PvP. Bear with me if you're rolling your eyes. Frustration comes from inconsistency, especially RNG elements. Relying on other people is a form of RNG. That sounds solipsistic, but you know what I mean. People are unpredictable. It can take 20 minutes or two hours to get a group ready. People have lives that don't sync with your own. People have bad connection. One game you'll run into level 20 noobs with bad weapons and no idea how to play. The next game you'll run into a full stack of sweats. Your skill level hasn't changed, but your performance is going to be completely variable, and therefore, so is the time taken. Unlike regular RNG, your skill is still a huge factor, but the frustration is present nonetheless, especially when it's something ridiculous like get 25 revenge medals. What makes this much, much worse though is that your frustration inevitably carries over to players on your team. Void Hand Cannon Kills for Thorn requires you to play with a weapon you're less comfortable with than your go-to loadout, which detriments your entire team. If death takes away progress, then you have to play extremely defensive, which means you aren't pushing the objective, once again, detrimenting your entire team. And if you have to do something like, I don't know, getting 100 calculated trajectories, yeah, that might detriment your entire team. It can mean a win or a loss. These aren't hugely irritating all the time. 20 hand cannon headshots for Ace of Spades, anyone can do that, and it's very unlikely to take more than an hour. The last word has always been a PvP-centric weapon, so it's fairer to have difficult PvP steps in that quest. The polar opposite of Thorn. You grind Crucible with those void hand cannons for a good four hours so you can get a gun that's only worth using in PvE. What a shock it is that this quest started in the salt mines. Forced PvP doesn't have to cause problems. I don't like Crucible, but if it's just kills that I need, objective caps and control, or anything that I can consistently do each game without detrimenting my team, then we're in a much better position. From this, we can conclude that a bad exotic quest step is frustrating like the Izanagi's bird in RNG, and a bad exotic quest step encourages suboptimal play like Void Hand Cannon Kills. This is too common in the lineup, but what plagues it is tedium. Tedium is born from boredom. 400 motes in Gambit, that's hours of doing the same thing over and over and over again, something I've already done for hours anyway. Obvious solution is to simply not focus on getting malfeasance, just go for motes when you're otherwise playing Gambit. But then there's no difference between the exotic quest and just hoping for an exotic to drop. And how about Truth? Truth is one of those quests where it's advisable to disregard every step because the only real step is going to YouTube and typing in Datto. That's it. Be Ascendant. Do this. Do an Ascendant challenge. Find these hidden things. It's all easy, but you'll have no chance of knowing what to do without a tutorial. So it's just doing what Datto says for however many hours. I bet that's some people's fetish. Izanagi's burden shares a similar problem, and so does the last word. You see that corner over there? You gotta He's crouch and hold the left stick Flexing forward the exactly one third of the rest. way as you walk right into that corner at an exactly 45 degree angle. You gotta hold that for 10 minutes. If you do it for a second more than that, or mess up the angle, or look down at all, you gotta start over. There, it's ridiculous, but sometimes it's understandable. I get that Bungie can't develop new content for every exotic weapon, and that they need to make an exotic quest take more than 15 seconds. So, spice it up with some lore? Or tell an overarching story like the adventures? I've said twice that rarity is only half the coin for exotics. Whether they're drops or quest rewards, the other half is coolness. Feeling exotic. In year one of Destiny, having an exotic was not just cool because they were rare, but because they were so powerful. Thorn, Last Word, Hawkmoon, remember that stuff? You might remember how overpowered they were, but that's not what I'm asking for. Good and cool aren't the same thing. There's a balance that needs to be struck. Forsaken has an excellent range of exotics, but few feel exotic, or even that good. So the effect of getting one, the fun of using one, isn't quite as potent. And without a completionist mindset, that isn't so good at motivating me to hop on the grind. Especially when there's very little that'd rival the worth of Whisper. Jotun, maybe? This wasn't so much a problem in year one because the balancing issues were quelled by the unlikelihood of having a Whisper tier exotic. Bungie have managed to piss off swathes of the community with year five's balancing issues. Overpowered items make the game unfun, then Bungie nerfs them into deep space and people get upset that they're now completely worthless. It's a cycle we're all too familiar with. I hear the idea buff, don't nerf, thrown around a lot. But surely it's supposed to be a balance. 
balance is exactly what we didn't have for a lot of Year 5, because there were various exotics like Skull of Dire Ahamkara that made the game trivial by continually restoring supers. There's no such thing as a trivial combat system that's fun in the long term. We needed those nerfs. But what happens with weapons far too often is that they're nerfed into oblivion. Whisper was the big gun for most of Year 5, which is why I refer to its power so often. But as of now, it's useless. There's better options for everything. In a respect, this is healthy. When Whisper was the best option for DPS, that felt like the only exotic and the only heavy you were allowed to use. Nerf it, you get something fresh, that's good. But I don't like the idea of exotics being so fleeting in their power, especially not the embodiment of a god. The ideal sweet spot is for there to be a conversation when selecting weapons. Considerations, benefits and drawbacks. A tough choice between a range of good choices. Weapons and armor should be nerfed or buffed into conversation. That's where we should be. When you have weapons like pre-nerf Whisper, there is no conversation. And that makes loot feel unrewarding because so much of it is essentially worthless. It's been five years, but Bungie still isn't on top of this. It's difficult, I'm sure. But why is it so tough to make the simplest of changes? Lord of Wolves has been broken for months. Why did it take them so long to act? Bungie needs to speed up with small changes, and I think they'd greatly benefit from a CTE server too. To conclude, the Year 5 exotic quests are vastly better than Year 4's offering. Zero Hour, new mission, brilliant. Thunderlord, nostalgia, callbacks, incredible. Ace of Spades is pretty fun too, and you know, I've heard the final part of the last word quest is hella fly, but we're still very far from ideal. It was quite amazing that on launch, the difficulty of the quest was inversely proportional with the quality of the weapon. I also find it disappointing that most of the truly desirable exotics are recycled from Destiny 1. Outbreak, Thorn, Last Word. I'll at least hand it to Lumina and Jotun for having that really unique feeling an exotic should have. So did Year 5 make exotics great again? No, but it's the best it's been for a while, and I'm very excited to see where Shadowkeep takes us loot-wise. Let's talk about shooting people. Is Crucible exist? Crucible is very difficult to talk about for me because I hate Crucible. I don't like getting one-shotted by supers, shotguns, heavies, shoulder charges, handheld supernovas, and then being respawned into enemy fire five times in one match. I don't like competitive, I find the game modes boring, and god damn do I suck at comp. I am not representative of anyone who wants to hear thoughts on Crucible. I'm just not normal. You know it, I know it, my psychiatrist knows it. But you don't need to like Crucible to understand some of the Year 5 changes. I never thought any PvP in Destiny 2 would recover from Year 1. That weird competitive focus that resulted in double primaries which made it unfun and by extension ruined PvE. Well, that's gone in hard reverse, which makes competitive play less balanced, but the Crucible more fun and varied overall. It's kind of a weird contrast with the introduction of Ranked, but I do have to praise the way they reward it. In many ways, it's more rewarding to receive a weapon that makes you better at killing real people than killing ads, but don't take that out of context. Context. One game mode I did play a lot of at launch was Breakthrough, a new game mode which still isn't Rift, or Skirmish, or Combined Arms, or Elimination, or King of the Hill, or Infection, or Escort, or Gun Game, or Trials, <laughs> or any highly sought after mode. No. It's a new competitive game mode that has two teams of four trying to hack the other team's vault. However, to do that, you have to progressively take points along the center line of the map. It's kind of like front lines from Battlefield. When I think Destiny, slow-paced 4v4 is exactly what I have in mind. On launch, this mode was a complete and total joke. Losing was winning because of small advantage, and teams would exploit it to farm kills for ELO. Good times. You still can't pick which game mode you want to play, but you can pick to not play it in the first place. Just like me. Thankfully, there is something for people like me who enjoys competitive games but doesn't like Crucible, and that is Gambit. Gambit is the next Crucible. PvP? VE. It's the kind of thing you'd expect with a new game, not with a new DLC. So, was Gambit a successful addition? In Gambit, two teams of four compete to spawn and subsequently kill a primeval the fastest. Every map is designed similarly. A spawn in the back, a bank in the center, and three wings that extend like the leaves of a shamrock. Enemies will spawn in one of these wings. Killing them drops moats, which you collect and then bank. 75 spawns your primeval. There's a degree of risk-reward to the collecting, because going for a high number of moats to bank will spawn a blocker on the enemy's side, which they have to kill before they can bank again. 5's a small, 10's a medium, and 15's a large blocker. Of course, they're best used when the enemy has a large amount of unbanked moats, not right after they bank them all. Strategizing the timing of your banks is also important for invasions. That's where PvP comes in. The invader gets 30 seconds, an overshield and highlighted targets to kill as many enemy players as they can, thus destroying their unbanked moats. 
The enemy team get the benefit of a 4v1 and can predict that the invader will spawn in one of two locations. On paper, it's well balanced. The strategy is to only send an invader in when the enemy has lots of unbanked moats, but without wasting a portal, since you can get another at 25, 50, and 75. With four people on the same page, you're making Wall Street's bank game look weak. It's tactical. When the primeval spawns, you can start working on your way to winning. But having a primeval doesn't make victory any more certain. The other team can now invade at a faster rate, and for every time they kill you, the primeval is healed. When both teams have a primeval, the game usually goes to whoever's invader is most skilled. Or at least it would, were it not for Sleeper Simulant. Yeah, you can tell that I wrote the first draft of this script a few weeks after launch. Plenty more than Sleeper rules these here parts. We've had Whisper Breaking Gambit, Hammerhead Breaking Gambit, Thunderlord Breaking Gambit, Queen Breakers Breaking Gambit instead of the Queen, which is false advertising, A Thousand Voices, Jotun, Izanagi's Burden, Truth. On paper, it's well balanced. In practice, Year 5 has been a meta nightmare. I was once killed in Dark Souls 3 by an absolute bugger using Karthus, and he messaged me after I died that to beat the cancer, you must become the cancer. Harsh, but true. When you have weapons like Hammerhead and Sleeper, which every invader will use because they need the advantage, the only way to even the playing fields is to use it as well. That's annoying and restrictive. Dying to an invader in Gambit heals your primeval, and that's such a big deal that many players will just kill themselves upon invasion to avoid screwing the team. When every invader uses one-shots, the advantage of surprise becomes a hell of a lot more powerful. And when dying to that one-shot is such a big deal, frustration is bred. Unfair hatred for the weapons that did it, too. This affects match outcomes in a bad way. As long as the enemy team has one remotely competent invader, being ahead in the race to get the first primeval can mean very little. All of that effort and strategy on the part of your entire team can be negated by one guy with whatever the meta heavy weapon was that day. The lost time and healing done to the primeval gives the enemy team easily enough time to catch up. It's not an advantage to be slowest, but being quickest just means too little too often. Clutch comebacks should ride on the back of highly skilled invaders and excellent DPS on the boss. Not okay invaders with their fancy Thunderlords. PvPvE as an idea presents numerous balancing issues, and that's primarily thanks to the ammo economy. There's a truckload of one-shot heavy weapons you rarely die to in Crucible because there's not enough ammo. But in Gambit, you're given drops balanced for PvE, even though there's a PvP element. This is the balancing nightmare put into words. A player needs far more than four sleeper shots to be worth using against the AI, but less than four for it to be fair when you're lighting up the enemy team. And because Bungie still refuse to simply make nerfs and buffs that only affect weapons in Gambit, any attempts they make at balance will end up affecting standard PvE and Crucible. Is it the engine, or is it straight up refusal? Because I don't understand why they'd rather screw with the meta so much over simply making game mode exclusive power changes. What else can they do? Well, the invader always needs a huge advantage over any given player on the enemy team. You take away one-shot weapons, you'll end up with a golden gun meta. My suggestion would be that stepping through the invasion portal saps your heavy ammo and leaves you with a set amount, depending on the weapon type. To compensate, the invader gets an extra buff. Aim assist is what broke sleeper, so not that. But speed? Maybe a teleportation ability or controlling enemy AI? I'd hate to see it come down to bans. The meta has made Gambit unfun for a very sizable proportion of the community. The next issue is the solo experience. Relying on the competence of three randoms when you're going up against a four stack is difficult. Completion and participation bounties are fine, but what if you want to win? There'll always be that one guy who decides that even though we're two away from Primeval, he's gonna try to get his 12 up to 15 for a large blocker bounty. And of course, he'll then fall off the map before he makes it to the bank. I'd love to see a Gambit solo queue and large blocker bounties removed. Aside from the numerous issues with it, at its core, Gambit is a blast. The way it condenses ad clearing, boss fights, and PvP into this small space and small space of time is incredible. It's deep, fast paced, and provides competitive and cooperative gameplay in the same mode. A solo queue, bounties that don't encourage bad play, and better balancing is the way to go in my opinion. And yet despite that, Gambit isn't exactly in most people's good books at the moment. And that isn't Gambit's fault. Season of the Drifter introduced Gambit Prime. It's one round instead of three, but the rounds are slightly longer and there's some other minor changes. Problem was, the entire season of the Drifter revolved around playing Gambit specifically to get better at playing Gambit. If you didn't like Gambit for any of the reasons I mentioned previously, this sure as hell didn't make it any better. In my clan, do you want to play Gambit is a joke, because no, no one wants to play Gambit. They've just spent three months playing Gambit. This is on the annual pass, but it's bred hatred for the mode among the community. I hope Bungie have learned what they needed to this year, because I absolutely think Gambit should remain a staple of the Destiny franchise. Is it a good game mode? Yes. Was it successful? Depends on who you ask. The annual pass made a lot of mistakes. 
Let's see what our $35 was worth. Was the annual pass a superior model to double DLC drops for the Destiny community? We can assume, given what Bungie have said about making Destiny a hobby again, that the annual pass is designed for the hardcore audience, not the goddamn casuals. Well, here's a confession. I love Destiny, but not once have I ever stuck around for more than three months after a big content drop. Destiny as a hobby is great, but even before I was busy with the channel, I didn't have the time or the enthusiasm to play Destiny every time something minor was added. Never played a Crimson Days, never played a Dawning. Unless there's new content to consume, I can't find a reason to come back. Environments, stories, weapons, the whole Destiny experience. Sure, this theory hasn't worked out so far because the DLC campaigns are all terrible, but I would have come back if they weren't. The big issue with that model is that a campaign isn't something you repeat a hundred times, certainly not something you'd want to. You do it once, and a couple more times as daily heroics, but endgame content is specifically designed to be repeated, to be grinded on, but not in a sexy way. That kind of content just isn't enough to bring me back when I could be playing the new Senran Kagura game. So I didn't, and I wouldn't have touched it at all if it weren't for this video. I had murmurs and mixed response, but I never once felt like I was missing out. The exotics, now they sounded good. Thorn, Lumina, Le Monarch, god damn I wanted them. The raids, they looked fun, they looked interesting. But the content, until the menagerie there was absolutely nothing that interested me. The Reckoning is a shallow meat grinder, the Forge is a shallow meat grinder. The Haunted Forest was free and it's deeper than the pair of them. You just shoot people and chuck balls around, if I wanted to do that no, no, I'm sorry, I can't make that joke. I wouldn't go out of my way to play the Forges, even if I had spent the $35 it took to have access to them. And as for the raids, while I am extremely pleased with Bungie for providing three raids in the space of one year, first time ever, $35 and a light grind? It's just not worth it. And that's not all. Forsaken's story was absolutely fantastic, but we were blue balls by the way it closed. We lost. At the very least, we're certainly not winning. I expected that the annual pass would involve something relevant that would culminate in Shadowkeep and lead us into the true war against the darkness. Whatever Bungie's plan is, it feels weird, wrong even, for the Guardians to pay so little attention to an Oryx level threat sitting right there for an entire year, unless we're assuming the time loop wipes our memories. Maybe it's true for the Guardians, but not for us. I would have felt like I was missing out if the annual pass continued the story that I was already invested in, instead of coming up with mediocre to non-existent new ones. The season of the Drifter came the closest to a narrative that seemed valuable, primarily through the Drifter himself. I love how they detail all of his suffering, and tell how life has led him to become chosen by an emissary of the Nine. The Drifter doesn't know why, you don't know why, but we can see through all of his charm that it's little more than a mask. He's preparing for something, something that is coming, soon. Not Cabal on the field, not Hive, not Vex, something more. I think the Drifter and whatever we've been doing for him by playing Gambit so much will end up being key in the war to come, which makes Season of the Drifter pretty much the only annual pass narrative that's relevant to the overarching plot, unless you count the new Callus lore entries. I am a very passionate Destiny fan, but only at the times when Destiny has more to offer than everything else. From my perspective, and I think the casual perspective who once would have come back to go through DLC campaigns, the annual pass was a worthless prospect. But if the seasons were sold individually, I would have bought Season of Opulence. I might have considered Season of the Forge. I don't understand why this wasn't an option, but I'm glad that at the time of writing, the price has been cut enough that the value was worthwhile. Despite everything, I don't think that the annual pass was a mistake. Not allowing individual purchases, certainly. But as a structure, no. Because looking back on the releases and hearing from players, it seems that the hardcore audience was far better catered to than ever before. There were far more reasons to play, a much richer endgame. Two raids, plus Last Wish from Forsaken. For a year-round Destiny fan, the annual pass was undoubtedly more of a success than the previous models. It was a success for that sect of the Destiny community, and it will have to remain that way. The annual pass simply does not take anywhere near as much effort as a full DLC, a fact that will become crucial now that Bungie has left Activision. No more Vicarious Visions, no more High Moon Studios. It's all up to Bungie now. They have confirmed that this will be Year 6's model too. I have no doubt it's down to resources. But this doesn't have to be a bad thing. The Year 6 annual pass is capable of being more than it was at a similar cost. Firstly, we follow the words of Ren's reviews. The annual pass should have cost less than 35 bucks, Bungie, are you being serial? Forsaken costed 40. Pretty sure the annual pass wasn't 7 eighths as big or as good as that. Especially since, thankfully, you didn't need it to play Zero Hour or level your character. If it had been around the 20 buck mark, I might have bitten on launch instead of 10 months later. Secondly, keep the jumping in points. Right now, if you talk to Benedict, you can get a quest that'll spit you out at 690. And that's exactly what I did. Sure as hell wouldn't have bothered with opulence if I had to grind up to it. We keep this concept, but don't overdo it. We still have to ensure that the previous season wasn't a waste of time. You got something out of Black Armory because of the Black Armory weapons. Season of the Drifter? What did you get from that? 
A conniption? I didn't care that I didn't play it, which is kinda tough on the people who did. Bungie should make sure that it's easy to jump into a new season, and that every season is worth playing in the end. Third, keep relevancy to current plots. Subplots like Black Armory are fine, as long as they're relevant. It means the season has the benefit of using the investment people already have in the ongoing story. Fourth, creative activities. I'm certain the Menagerie took much more work than the Reckoning or the Forges, but how much of what made Menagerie fun was just plain creativity? Capturing points while being overrun with Thrall? Doing the Gauntlet from the Leviathan Raid? I mean, there's barely anything to the lamplighting, but it's still fun in a game mode designed around mixing stuff up. Simple arenas constantly reusing assets but using them creatively. Taken King was a masterclass in this concept. Stick with it, because if there's even a hint of boredom in the central activity, you'll put people to sleep for three months. Fifth, don't do a season of The Drifter. Don't center three months of progression around Gambit or Crucible, period. Increased relevance on it, that's absolutely fine. But Gambit's got issues, and that's all people are going to remember after three months of play. So is the annual pass better than two DLC drops? Well, it doesn't matter. But yes, and there's tons of room for improvement. Time to wrap up. Is Destiny in a good spot to move forward? Year 5 was the best year of Destiny by a mile. For once, we got a good expansion without a year-long content drought to follow. Year 5 is the day to Year 4's night. But I didn't have more fun with Forsaken than I did with Taken King. And that's because the entire experience was built on a solid bed of crap. Gameplay you can tweak. They did. Progression is fixable. It was. The awful Red War, followed by two even worse DLC campaigns, mediocre planets, boring 4v4 crucible maps, and an entire year's worth of repeated cock-ups that left the community either gone or infuriated. That's a good chunk of the foundation of Destiny 2. Some of it'll be that way forever, and the rest will leave permanent scars. This game lacks the charm of Destiny 1. The music of the spheres. The way they were consistent with their own lore. The way the villains felt like a threat. The way the planets had interesting, memorable locations. The original Hour. Everything. Forsaken, God, was nearly a masterpiece. And it had none of those issues. But it's what? A third of the game? It cannot fix the mess it's stuck to. It seems like we've just forgotten. You know, traumatic experiences have strange effects on the mind. But let's just look back for a second in retrospect. Since launch in 2017, which was its own failure, we've had Eververse microtransactions that contained every cosmetic item worth a damn ruining Crimson Days, the XP throttling that made it harder to get bright engrams without telling the player, and then the fix that just made it harder to get bright engrams without telling the player in a different way. Curse of Osiris, which was $20 for two hours of content and no endgame. Curse of Osiris, where 50% of the items were in the Eververse store. Curse of Osiris, which locked heroic strikes to Curse of Osiris owners. Curse of Osiris, which locked the Prestige Raid and Prestige Nightfall to Curse of Osiris owners. At a time when the dead endgame was the biggest problem the game had. Oh yeah, and PvP was broken a couple times. Probably be easy to count the times it hasn't been broken. In 2017, Destiny did have a shot at redemption. Forsaken was one year hence. And still, all was forgiven. I don't want Destiny to die, but I feel like I'm in an abusive relationship at this point. Was it right to forgive them for everything? Is it right to assume that Forsaken is a rule, not an exception? Well, I have some thoughts on that. Destiny 2 doesn't have a fraction of the soul the first did. We don't have those stories about adventures and exotics and raids anymore. We've got the remnants of an ill-used foundation, and we still have to look past that for Shadowkeep. But the thing is, Forsaken restored the mechanical aspect of the foundation. It replaced the floorboards, even though the earth is still rotten. Gameplay, triumphs, and a setup to what could be an incredible story. The witch that no doubt had the biggest part to play in the game's repeated failures is dead. Activision is gone. Every year we say, next year. With Forsaken we didn't have to, but let's say it anyway, out of excitement instead of desperate hope. If anything is going to change Destiny for the better, it's Shadowkeep. I think it's more right to be hopeful now than ever before. Though a clean slate sounds so attractive to me, we are now in a better position than ever to ignore the failures of Year 4. When Shadowkeep comes out, we can just pretend that Forsaken was Destiny 2's launch. Is Destiny 2 in a good spot to move forward? It needs to make the final push to excise what it was now more than ever. The gameplay is there. The loot is there. We have a solid game and a story raring to go. My answer is yes. Time will tell, but Shadowkeep will put Destiny on its final path. Here's to another triumph, a victory that paves the path for a hundred more. I hope to see you guys on the moon in September, where once and for all, we'll know the way this franchise is going. I'll try to cover that sooner rather than later this time, so do stay tuned if you're interested. The big thing I missed in this video was the raids, but I did so for the sake of the video. It took me three days to get Leviathan footage, and I ended up talking about it for 30 minutes. 
This year, there were three raids, and I have to get this video out before Shadowkeep. Even a rush order would be late, and rushing is about the best way it's physically possible to bias your opinion of something. I recommend the legend himself and Datto, who is also a legend, for in-depth looks at the raids. If you're a nostalgia junkie, but your idea of nostalgia is looking back at things with seething hatred, uh, <laughs> You might enjoy my original critique of Destiny 2. I hope to continue covering this franchise for as long as I can. These videos are made so much easier to produce thanks to your donations. Every dollar truly does make a difference, so if you have a couple bucks to spare, it would go a long way. I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.